Awful doesn't mean awful in every respect. Medieval life was different, huh? Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today we've sort of got a working video, a making video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a uh, sheath for this dagger here, this bollock dagger. And while I'm making it, and I'm going to make it fast, we're going to talk. Because recently I made a film and it was about why uh, medieval swords were often so very, very bad. I mean, it's partly why and partly the fact that they just were awful. Not all of them. And that's the point. Not all of them. Now, as a friend of mine, Jerome, he made a very good point, which made quickly and roughly doesn't mean badly. So bear that in mind. Because the thing is, our priority sets are different to their priority sets. For us, symmetry, flatness, lack of scratches and so on, these things are obviously clearly important to the modern day and age. You know, we all obsess by it. But you can look at the work back then and they weren't obsessed by that. Does it function? Yeah, they want that. Beyond that, not so important. But we're going to just make this sheath, we're going to chat about it, and we're going to see how we go along. So first up, I have a 15th century bullet dagger. It's fairly rudimentary. It's a plain one. It's a simple working man's one. Now, it's got a flat back on here, so you can work with it. But obviously, the guy who used to own this, he likes getting in a fight, so it's got double-edged fighting blade as well. This kind of style bullet dagger, it's relatively common because it's a cross between a working knife and an all-purpose knife. And part of that purpose is civil defence or just enjoying a fight, whatever it was. Because actually, uh, buckler and dagger fighting, it, it was genuinely, it was a sport. It was a thing people did. Anyway, that's an aside. So this is our dagger today. We have some two millimetre veg tan leather. We've got a couple of bones, a needle and thread, and a knife. That's it. That's it. So we're going to go. So we're going to dampen the leather. Just a little bit now, and that's going to allow us to form it onto this knife. So as I said, awful doesn't mean awful in every respect, because they had a different priority set. It's, it's really evident by what they did. But one of the things that I did mention in that film that seemed to excite people was I said years ago I had a client who wanted a very badly made knife. So he wanted a very badly made sheath. You all wanted to see what that badly made sheath was like. And unfortunately, of course, it was sold years ago. So I couldn't do that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to badly make a sheath. Now, there was a guy, you have to bear this in mind, but there was one of the comments. There was a guy who was a welder. And he said something really interesting which is, he said he did a lot of work on piecework. So that is, you get paid for every single piece that you make. You're not on a wage, you're on piecework. Now that was the way a lot of medieval work was done. Now he said, what you do, first thing you do when you're given a new job, is you find out what the quality is, the minimum quality standard. Then you work to that, add 10%, make yourself safe, and you don't do a jot more work. Because what's the point? You're not paid for it. All it does is it slows you down. So actually, by doing a better job, all you're doing is you're denying food for your family, right? You're denying shelter for the people that you love the most. That's all you're doing. So what you don't do is do the best job that you can every time. It's not about that. It's piecework. Do the minimum that you can do. And that is evident, absolutely evident, in medieval workmanship. But before I carry on, I'm just going to show you some bits from this book here. So this is uh, Museum of London book, Knives and Scabbards. For anybody interested in medieval stuff, get this book. But if we have a look through here, I've just put some little tags in. Some of the work is really very good. Now if we look at, oh, something, something like this piece here, so on 121, page 121, it's a nice piece of work. It's not stunning. But then actually we can go across here on page 120. The work's a little bit rough, really, to be honest. It's done quickly. And then we come to something like this, page 140, this one here, knife 434. It's awful. It's done super fast. But what's also interesting about it, the front face, it's got some stuff on it, it's got some incised decoration. But what's interesting is on 434, the back as well, they filled the back space as well. And they do that. Medieval things, you cannot leave a surface undecorated and very often uncoloured. So a lot of these knife sheaths, actually in reality, they would have been painted. We don't do that because we don't like it. It feels wrong. But actually, that's what they would have done. Again, we look at numbers, well, 
483, and then the absolute beauty in this book, 484. Look at it, it's just absolutely awful. Absolutely awful. But they've gone to the effort of decorating the front and the back. And the tool I forgot to show earlier was the awl. It's just a sharp spike, that's all it is. And you can't push the needle through the leather, so you need a spike to do it. Now, again, you could do some sort of beautiful, really careful stitch pattern. A lot of them, six millimeters, quarter of an inch apart, something like that. Because again, every stitch, it's time. And you know, these medieval people, life was harder for them, you know? It really was. And so by being slow, actually what you're doing is you're choosing to earn less money. And like I said, they had different priorities to us. So now you can't just ram something out really quickly and it's absolutely awful because nobody will buy it. So actually you're defeating yourself, right? But back then it was different. Somebody would buy it because it didn't matter. Now when I say it didn't matter, I can't know that for a fact, but what I can know is it didn't seem to matter. And it might well be a bit like the, the comment I pinned right at the top of the last film I did. It might quite simply be, people didn't see it. And that seems like a really stupid thing to say, because of course you can see asymmetry, you can see bad workmanship. Of course you can see that. But actually, maybe they couldn't. So when you watch a black and white film, you might wonder at the acting, you might go, oh, they don't make them like they used to, or this story is brilliant, or whatever it might be. But actually, you're probably not very likely to go, oh, you know what? The real world's not black and white, is it? Ah, oh, this is rubbish. It's not black and white at all. You're just not likely to do that. It's not a thing. You just enjoy the film. And I think that this might be a little bit like that. Just running a stitch down the back here. Rather annoyingly, actually, because obviously I'm making this for a film and I want it to be perfect. <laughs> There's an irony. Annoyingly, I've actually put these holes a bit far in from the edge. They should be much closer than this. But anyway, here we are. But actually, one of the interesting things as well is I'm sewing this around the blade. Now I do that because it makes for a really nice scabbard, nice sheath. It's not actually necessarily the case that knives were sold with sheaths. It may well be that they were sold separate or certainly on occasion. So have a look at this picture. And this is page 61. It's one of my favorite pictures like ever actually, because it just makes me laugh. I think it's mid 14th century, but you've got a knife seller's stall here. And it's not entirely clear whether the knives are being sold with the scabbards. It really isn't. And so it's conceivable that you bought the two separate. Now, that's, you know, kind of looks like that to me. I'm not sure, it's what they think. But the other detail, I can't show you this picture without, is, look at that. Knife sellers, a couple of ladies there, fine ladies talking about the knives they're buying. A Couple of people having sex in the street in front of the stall. Everyone's ignoring them. Medieval life was different, huh? When I make sheaths, I usually do it from two layers. I want them to be robust. I want them to feel good. I want them to feel like quality. And actually, that's nice. But very often it wasn't done like that. There is a little bit of evidence, not a lot, but there is a bit of evidence that they did sometimes line them, that you put two layers of leather. But actually mostly it was one. Now I'm using two mil cowhide here. That was a common material. But another common material, amazingly, was one millimeter sheepskin or calf skin. And I find that amazing. And for those of you who don't know, so one millimeter, it is, oh, I can't even think what it is in Imperial. Um, Anyway, go look it up. It is way less than a sixteenth of an inch. It's just, just over half that. It's not thick leather. It's soft. It's wobbly. It doesn't take a set very well. It's just utterly, utterly unsuitable. Yet they did it. And so actually, in a way, you have to wonder, perhaps, whether sheaths were almost a disposable item. That, well, often they just weren't good enough to care about. Because the thing is, if you put a sharp knife into one millimeter leather, I'm telling you now, it's not gonna last very long before it starts to cut through. It's just where it is. Some of you people out there are very smugly saying, well, I'm, I'm from Amsterdam, I'm from Helsinki, I'm from Dublin, our stuff was much better. You sure about that? 
have a look at this. So, Sheath Scabbard's Grip Coverings, another really good book. So this one is from Helsinki. It's got a lot of good work in it, and you'll be pleased to know Finnish people actually seem to be a little bit better than uh, the London work. But we can then look at just absolute beauties like this. So page 160. Again, it's just somebody has scrawled on it. That's all it is. It's just awful. But then actually what's interesting, flicking through these books last night when I was preparing for this, is a lot of the patterns are exactly the same as you would find in the London finds. And then you pick up a book like this one from Dublin, and again, you find a similar level of quality, but you also find the same patterns again. And so what you need to remember, of course, is that trading from London up across the channel, up uh, the coast, up towards Finland, Denmark, uh, around to the Baltic, it's all the same thing. It's all the same route. The goods are just going up and down, up and down. And so actually you expect to find the same kind of things. And if you expect to find the same kind of things, you expect to find the same kind of quality. So page 113 from the Dublin book. Again, uh, example up here, 209. Oh, just dreadful work. It's done really fast. It's done, frankly, without care. They're filling a space. They're making it look all right. And that's it. When you look through those books as well, or you look through finds in museums, the way it's made and what they've made it with tells you a lot about who made it. So for instance, a lot of these things are incised. The decoration is carved in, but a lot of them it's actually stamped where you hammer in uh, a mark. Now the only people who've got leather stamps are professional leather workers. So, you know, an incised piece, yeah, sure. Anybody could have made it. But if it's got stamp work on it, you now know that it's made by a professional leather worker. You might assume that actually even the stuff with stamping on or the stuff with stamping on should be good. But you know, it's not. It just isn't. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna work quickly. Because now we are pretending that I'm on piecework and I'm doing the sort of decoration that you see on some of those scabbards. And that's simply done. But nonetheless, it all takes time. But the point is, if your children are waiting for you to get home so you can buy them some food, can't take too long. Oh, see, there you go, I've gone outside. And we'll have a look at this in a minute. And we can decide if it's a good bit of work or not. I think the answer is obviously not. But does it look suitably medieval, like many of those pieces? Well, I'd argue it does, really. And they did a lot of this sort of geometric space filling. Because it does things quickly. And then what we will do here is we will just, for no good reason at all, we'll put a little pointy star in. Ah, lovely. What a beauty. But that, ugly, horrible as it is, is the kind of quality an awful lot of sheaths are made of. Now we're going to do just a little bit of patterning down here so you can see it's another common sort of a pattern just filled into this and this pattern spreads a lot of time. You see it for hundreds of years. It's sort of, I don't really know what it is. It's sort of clouds really. Well, I call it clouds. And finished. So you may think at this point that I'm laboring my argument, that I'm basically just showing you all the rubbish out of these books. Well, actually, yes, I am. You know, I'm not pretending otherwise. There's lots of really good work in that. But what I am saying is don't just think because it's in a museum, because it's on display, because a craftsman of old made it, that it's good. 
It's not. But the other side of that is that they must have thought so very differently. And that's what I find really intriguing uh, about history, is how things are the same, but yet they are different. Our priorities are totally different. Things have just utterly changed. Now, when it comes to making a sword or a leather sheath, there are hundreds of processes in it. Now, you are almost never going to get perfect because the point is one mistake in any one of those processes and suddenly the piece is not perfect. And the thing is, you can't, you just can't go back and remake that piece each time because if you're trying to make a living, if you're trying to feed your children, if you're trying to pay the debt collector, if the client is coming to pick the thing up tomorrow, you just have to make it work. And even Henry VIII's armour for the Field of Cloth of Gold, you know, one of the wealthiest kings in, in Europe, even his armour has rivet holes in it where they've made mistakes and they've filled them. You can see them. Go look at it in Leeds Armouries. You can see the mistakes that they made. And that is the armour for one of the wealthiest kings in Europe. Nothing was perfect. But was it ever truly this awful? Because it is pretty awful. You know, I'll give you that. Yeah. It was. Have a look at these. I've got weapons of war here. Now this is about the Mary Rose. So it's actually not even knife sheaths, it's, it's archer's braces. But it's got a good spread of them so we can see the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It's also a bit later than medieval period, you know, this is 1546. But, you know, leatherwork hasn't moved on that much. Now if we look at 655, you can see that clearly they're capable of making fantastically detailed, fantastically produced work. Brilliant. Absolutely. Like, just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful work. Perfect? No. Flawless? No. Wonderful? Yes. And then we turn the page and we get to page 356. Now look at that. These are archer's braces, right? And even here, so this is page 657, the representations of fleur-de-lis suggest a high status for the wearer. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that because they did use sort of heraldry in all sorts of ways, really. But the point that I'm making is look at that appalling quality. Just look at it. It's like, it's incomprehensibly bad. And what you need to understand as well is like we were talking about earlier, these are stamps. Your sailor doesn't have a fleur-de-lis uh, leather stamp, you know, so he hasn't made this when he's bored or your archer or anything else. These are made by professionals and look at the appalling quality. Then we'll flip the page again. We've got more of it. More of the same, more archers' wristbands, braces, which is just dreadful. You know, I don't know if are there any more on the next page. Yeah, there's even one here which has just got a bit of random scrawling on the edge. I mean, that might be cracking or something else. Might not be. Might actually genuinely be decoration. And I think that's probably about the end of it. But the point is, you get the idea. But before we move on, for those of you not familiar with the Mary Rose, uh, those archers were the king's bodyguard. They were the best archers in the country, or at least supposedly so. Either way, well paid, better paid than your average archer, better equipped, right? They were the best, and that was their gear. Maybe they didn't see it. Maybe it's like that pinned comment on the other film. They just didn't see it. Maybe they didn't care. I, I, who knows? Who knows? But another comment on that film that you see quite a lot was no true craftsman is going to make something below their best ability. I have so, so got an issue with that. In the modern world now, if I've got a job, I'm a dentist, right? I've got loads of money, no problem at all. I can go home to my lovely workshop in the garage there and I can make a sword, or I can make a knife scabbard over four months. Doesn't matter, I can find everything's beautiful, everything's lovely. You can produce something that's perfect and you can be really proud of your craftsmanship and you're great there. Sorry, I'm not picking on dentists. Brilliant, it's great. But if you have to feed your family on that work, you have to make decisions. And those decisions don't allow you to go, oh, there's a little bit of a file stroke there. I don't like, I'm going to remake that part. It's not. You make it, if it's good enough, like a welder said, if it's good enough, you make it, bosh it out, dum, done, next. Craftsmen, there's nothing special about them. They're people who need to eat and live too. And to get some sort of an idea of the speed required to make a bracer of that quality, I've got one which I cut out here earlier on. So we're going to dip it in water. I'm going to whack those marks in and we're going to see how fast that I can turn this around. I 
almost done. And so that's it. I'm gonna put the straps on this, show you what it looks like. Dreadful, by the way. But I can do better work than this. So if you wanna see the custom stuff, come down to toddsworkshop.com. If you want the production stuff, go to toddcutler.com. Full of amazing things that will interest you. But turn your bell notifications on, subscribe to the channel, buy the merch, come visit the website. Help us survive, you know? And here is our finished bracer. I wasn't gonna say anything else, but if you wanna win this thing in all of its awfulness, dreadfulness, go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. So toddcutler.com or toddsworkshop.com, sign up for the newsletter. And whoever it is in one week's time from the release of this video, whose name is drawn, will get this put in the post to them free of charge. Anyway, hope you enjoy the video. I'll see you again. Thanks.